With me is Patrice Jones. Patrice is the co-founder of The Vine Sanctuary and over the years Patrice has played a role in different movements such as the peace movement and the LGBTQ liberation movement. And in her presentation today she will explain the intersectionality of the oppression of women and non-human animals and argue that understanding this link is essential to building a consistent animal liberation movement. Is that correct? <laughs> Then, uh, thank you very much. The floor is yours. Merci. So I don't, I don't like standing on the stage. Uh, it's very uncomfortable to be elevated in this way. So I think I will sit down for a minute. Um, yeah. So. So I do come here from Vine Sanctuary, which is in the United States, and um, one of the thing, one of the reasons that I try to be sure to mention that is because uh, for the past 13 years, um, I have been involved in animal liberation activism. I came to this after several decades of social justice activism. And what's really clear to me uh, from getting up every morning uh, at sunrise to take care of chickens and cows uh, and spending time lugging uh, water jugs around, uh, that most of the most important ideas that I've had um, have come uh, through this conjunction with the animals for whom we purport to act. Uh, and so one thing that I usually do uh, when I am coming to a place like this to talk is there's usually um, one of our sanctuary residents who will be in my mind. Um, yes? Uh, and and I, I don't get to choose who it will be. Um, she or he will sort of make themselves manifest to me. And today it is a cow called Pancho. And so I just want you to meet Pancho uh, before I start talking to you about ideas. Uh, Pancho uh, was the son of, of, of a cow uh, uh, who is on a dairy farm. And because he uh, and his brother Jasper were of no economic use to the farmer, they were tied to a tractor and left to starve. Uh, uh, until they were rescued and they came to the sanctuary. Uh, he came to the sanctuary as a calf, um, but now he's uh, just getting out of adolescence and into adulthood. He's very tall and gangly and good at yoga. Uh, he's very smart. And in his intelligence reminds me uh, that animals have their own ideas about what they want and what they would like us to do. Uh, he's uh, very vocal, so much so that I would never make the mistake of calling myself the voice of the voiceless, uh, because I'm quite clear that animals have their own voices. Um, And here's the best part. Uh, it's summer now, and, and in the mountains of Vermont, our uh, herds are uh, up, 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 up a mountain, uh, foraging in the woods. Uh, they hardly pay attention to the hay that we put out because they're so busy finding wild plants to eat. They hardly pay attention to the water that we make sure they have because they're drinking from the brooks. Uh, and what I have noticed just over this summer is that Pancho, even though he was bottle fed by us and thus started out very, very uh, human centered, has become more cow. Do you, do you know what I'm saying? Not if you know what I'm saying, because you're far away from me. Uh, uh, and this is beautiful. Uh, in his cowness, in his wild cowness, he is becoming more distant from me uh, and less attached to us as the people. Uh, and this is beautiful and reminds me 
that we are not the heroes of the animal liberation movement. This is not our role to save anybody, um, but rather to undo things that people have done in order to create a space for animals uh, to be themselves and pursue their own projects and their own aims. Pancho reminds me of that. But now I'm here to talk to you about intersectionality. And to do that, what I want to do is ask you to, I was going to ask you to look up, that's why I'm looking up, but, but you've been around in this place now for a little while, a few days, yes? And you know that we're here on the site of a former slaughterhouse, yes? You know this. You've seen the hooks. You've seen the gutters for the effluvia. You've seen maybe some feeding troughs. And I'm drawing your attention to where we are right now because the first thing that I need you to understand is that the exploitation of animals, the abuse of animals always takes place in particular places. It is a, an actual real event that takes place in particular places. And these particular places are always part of both social and material ecologies, systems, ideological systems, biological systems, yes? This particular place when it was a functioning slaughterhouse uh, existed within a particular economy of animal exploitation some people were making some profit from it. Uh, uh, it existed within a particular social circumstance. People who had certain ideas about animals, about food, about each other, were the ones. The ones who farmed so-called the animals, the ones who killed the animals, the ones who cut up the animals, the ones who ate the animals. All those people were themselves part of social ecologies. What I'm trying to say here is that every act, I'm gonna come down here with you, um, every act, of animal exploitation, every act of animal abuse is a product of certain forces. Historical forces, material forces, social forces. And none of those forces exist in isolation from one another. They are always part of systems. Think back to what you've seen when you've looked up and you've seen those hooks or the gutters. The hooks don't make any sense all by themselves. The gutters don't make any sense. The slaughterhouse itself was a system, right? And you can't understand the slaughterhouse by just looking at the hooks and trying to analyze them all by themselves. You have to understand how the hooks relate to the gate, relate to the gutter. And the hole turns out to be much more meaningful than the individual parts considered in isolation. Yes? Okay. And that system then also existed uh, within other systems, as I said, the economic systems, the social systems. So that's why I'm here to talk to you about uh, intersectionality, which is a conceptual tool a very useful conceptual tool. Intersect what do I mean by a conceptual tool? Um, trigonometry is an essential conceptual tool if you want to survey a field or build a bridge, right? 
Well, those of you who understand trigonometry are like, yeah, you totally need trigonometry for that. Uh, <laughs> and other people are like, I guess. <laughs> Uh, you'll just have to take me at face value. You need to know um, calculus uh, to do certain things in engineering, and, if you, and, 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 and that's an essential conceptual tool. So what I'm here to tell you is that intersectionality, like trigonometry, is an essential conceptual tool for those of us who want to survey the field of animal inequality and particularly how this might relate to other forms of inequality. And for those of us who would like to build bridges to other movements, which I think we need to do, because the other thing you might have noticed is that there aren't that many of us here. And Steve, uh, how many people here were here when Steve talked yesterday? Yeah, and he did this wonderful, um, job of, of, of communicating to us the absolute urgency of climate change. And, and, and I thought a pretty good job of diagnosing uh, some of the uh, problems that go into that. But then, I don't know if you remember that um, uh, then somebody uh, who was right around here raised the question, well, okay, so now what do we do? And then poor Steve, he was like flailing around. And I wanted to like say from the back of the room, it's okay, Steve, the feminists are coming. <laughs> <laughs> and, it, and it happens that we've been thinking about this for a really long time. We've been thinking about this whole question of how to build bridges between movements, get people to see the connections between what they're interested in and what you're interested in um, for literally decades now. So what we're gonna do here today is I'm gonna introduce you to a really important feminist concept called intersectionality, which, we, which, which, which began in the United States uh, within black feminist thought, uh, uh, but is not only an, uh, a U U.S. Uh, product because uh, this concept uh, proved to be so interesting and useful that then uh, activists um, working all over the world in different social movements have uh, picked it up, thought about it, extended it, used it, carried it forward. So I'm gonna to talk to you a little about the history of the concept because you can't understand it if you don't know the history and I'm really tired of people using the word as some vague sort of reference to race. Um, so I want us to understand the concept, but also because it's a really useful concept. Uh, then I'm gonna talk to you about the implications of the concept. I'm gonna talk to you about the things you might need to do to prepare yourself to work intersectionally. And then I'm gonna give you some examples that you've already heard here at the conference of intersectional work uh, in the hope that this will spark uh, your work. I'm also going to give you some sort of basic tenets of, uh, of uh, ecofeminist praxis. Um, this is a very different thing than saying, oh, we all should do this or we all should do that. Um, I'm going to talk to you about some, some basic principles that should guide our activism, uh, 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 one of them being that we need to understand uh, uh, the biodiversity of strategies and tactics and that uh, the last thing we need to do is have all of us doing the same thing. Okay, following me so far? Somebody was talking to me the other day about how Americans move around a lot when they're talking. Um, and I'm, I'm worse than most, but that's just, we'll have to deal with that. Okay, so, I'm actually nowhere near, there are people here who have seen me talk before, right? I'm not hyper at all right now, right? Right, you've seen me like fall over things and write on myself and trip and yeah. I haven't done any of that yet, I'm really excited. Um, but these steps, uh, that's gonna be dangerous. Um, 
Okay, so, so, all right, so uh, time warp back uh, to round about the late 1960s uh, in the United States when both the uh, feminist movement and the civil rights movement were active. And what was happening uh, at that time was that uh, 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 women of color in each of these movements were encountering sort of mirror image problems. In other words, within the civil rights movement, they were being told uh, that their concerns as women had to wait until racial justice was achieved. And uh, within the feminist movement, they were being told that, of course, what's most important is the thing that we all share as women, uh, and um, uh, 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 not even we're not even really going to think about race. Um, and so uh, the first, and so this was frustrating, of course, right? Uh, 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 because you can't. Yeah, you, you can see why. So, 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 people started reaching for ways to try and talk about the experiences of women of color in the United States uh, who were experiencing both racism and sexism. And the first concept that someone came up with that got some wide play was the concept of double jeopardy. The idea that, 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 that women of color in the United States were experiencing both racism and sexism at the same time. Uh, but double jeopardy proved to be not entirely adequate to explain the experience because double jeopardy makes it sound like double is like one plus one. Yeah, so it's like racism plus sexism. And when you add two things together, you can also really easily separate them back apart. Yeah? Like if I, if I pull this and this, and then I can say, well, this is this piece and this is that piece. And the experience of racism and sexism um, uh, uh, in conjunction with one another was not one where it was very easy to say, oh, this piece of it is racism and this piece of it is sexism. It turned out that the relationship was more multiplicative. What's, um, uh, what's six times seven? 42. 42. Okay, everybody imagine 42. Okay, now which of those is the six and which is the seven? You can't say, can you? No, because the 42 is the product of the six and the seven in interaction with one another. And so, a black feminist thinker by the name of Kimberly Crenshaw uh, was the first to use the term intersectionality to try and explain this multiplicative interactional phenomenon between racism and sexism. And if you're interested, all you have to do is, and you, and you read English well, because uh, it's kind of a high-flown article, uh, then you can just Google Crenshaw intersectionality, and you'll find the PDF of the very original article that she wrote about this. It's interesting to read. Uh, so why did she choose this word intersection? Well, imagine that we are at the intersection of uh, Rue de Luxembourg and... Tell me another street. Somebody from here. Rue du Canal. Okay, so we're at that intersection. <laughs> and we're standing right in the middle of the intersection. Which is one street and which is the other? The intersection is the product of both, yes? And sometimes, intersections are the products of more than one road, yes? We've all been to those, especially it's dreadful when you're biking and there are cars too, yes? And there are seven different streets coming into the intersection. Wow, that's dangerous. You can have some car crashes at intersections. Okay. So now you see the concept of intersectionality, uh, which started out being something that we talked about with regard to race and gender, 
But we've since extended to talk about other forms of subjugation because, of course, immediately people started to say, well, you know, it's not just race and class, uh, it's not just race and sex. What about, what about poverty? What about class? Uh, what about immigration status? What about disability? And so this idea begins with just the understanding that the relationship between different forms of oppression, and we'll get to speciesism in a minute, it's definitely in that intersection, hmm? uh, but my feeling and the feeling of other people who've thought about this is that it actually is sort of foundational to the other forms of oppression. And if we can understand how that is, and we can talk about how that is, then we can start to make some serious alliances and get some serious activism going. But let's keep going with intersectionality um, and its extensions before we get to extending it out to speciesism. So it starts out, we're thinking about intersectionality with regard to race and gender. And the basic idea here is that it's a product of the interaction, you can't separate them out. And then as we started analyzing it, we realized, oh my gosh, it's not just that they're interacting in such a way that they can't be separated out. It is also that they support one another. They prop each other up. Huh? The easiest way to see that is with the intersection of uh, homophobia and sexism. So a woman by the name of Suzanne Farr wrote a book called Homophobia, A Weapon of Sexism. And this book, by the way, is also free online in PDF form, thanks to Suzanne Farr. So you can read the whole thing. It was written in the 80s, so it's kind of dated. Uh, but the basic idea is still e extraordinarily useful and valid. And here it is. Actually, no, let me just ask you a question and then you'll begin to get the idea. Do you have to be gay to be gay bashed? No? Do you have to actually be homosexual to be called by one of the bad names that people call gay men and lesbians? No? Do you have to actually be trans to be subjected to transphobia? Well, what do you have to do? What do you have to do to be gay bashed? What? Wear a pink shirt, for example. If I wear a pink shirt? If you wear a pink shirt as a man. Okay, so it turns out that all you have to do to be subjected to homophobic discrimination or violence is transgress gender norms. Is transgress gender norms. And it turns out then that homophobia is not really about homosexuality at all. I mean, yes, some of homophobia has to do with bias. Some of it has to do with prejudice. Some of it has to do with ignorance. Sure, that's in there. But what Suzanne Farr led us to understand is that there is a structural function to homophobia. And the structural function of homophobia is to maintain the gender system, is to keep men in their place and women in their place. Make sense? Now this was very exciting to think about because now, and this is how it actually happened, before she had that insight, feminists never did any work on homophobia. After she wrote that book, feminists all understood that if they wanted to do something about sexism, they also had to do something about homophobia. Genius. Now you're starting to see where I'm going, yeah? Okay, why it might be very, very, very important for us to understand and be able to articulate the relationship of speciesism to 
uh, social injustice and environmental despoliation. I have to look and see what I'm going to say next. How far? Oh, 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 okay. So, another set of ideas that's really useful for you to understand um, that's, that's part of intersectionality, we're extending it out, so right? So the first, first we're just thinking about race and uh, sex. We start thinking about class. Suzanne Farr comes up with these great ideas about how homophobia fits into the intersections. And now here come some uh, eco-feminists and they're interested in saying, how do, we, how do we work this all out with environment? How do we, does this link up at all with how we treat the earth or not? Uh, and not surprisingly, their, their conclusion was, oh yes, it matters, it links up uh, 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 very much so. Uh, and and ecofeminists have come up with a number of ideas that have been useful to us in thinking through that intersection. Uh, uh, but but one of the, the, the most useful and the simplest to understand uh, is the idea of the logic of domination. The logic of domination. Uh, Val Plumwood is someone who has talked about this. Uh, Greta Gard, G-A-A-R-D. Lori Gruen. Okay. In a nutshell, the logic of domination is our term then for the way of thinking that patterns all the different forms of oppression, okay? And they say, well, let's call that way of thinking the logic of domination. Okay, so, so ecofeminists are not saying we should logically dominate anybody, uh, the opposite. What we're trying to say is you, here's this logic, this way of thinking that leads to that domination that, 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 that Steve was talking about yesterday. Okay, the logic of domination, uh, the theory of the logic of domination, uh, the logic of domination first of all divides the world into binary, two, dualisms, yeah? which are conceived as opposite one another with one better than the other. Male, female, human, animal, black, white. Well, if I'm saying, let's see, male, female, human, animal, it would be really useful if I had a board at this point, yes? Uh, uh, white of color, uh, uh, Oh, reason and emotion, mind and body, culture and nature. And in each of these, and we could go on, yes? And in each of these instances, the, the, the two items on either side of the divide are, cons are, are considered to be opposite one another, to considered to be separate. Not just separate, but opposite. And one over the other. And of course, all three of those things are, are untrue. Uh, 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 humans are animals. So how could humans be the opposite of animals? And I'm sorry, um, even, even, even if we didn't know that there are intersexed people, uh, the idea that males and females are opposite one another? Males and females of the same species, right? How much of our genes do we share? What, 90, what, we share like 98% of our genes with chimps, um, and I think with other humans, it's like, uh, what? More than 99% with every other human. So how in the world could you be the opposite of a being uh, with whom you share, yeah, you get my point. Um, oh, oh, nature and culture, oh, that's a great one, right? Uh, we're social animals, yes? It is the nature of social animals to construct cultures. Um, oh my gosh, what were some of the, oh, 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 reason and emotion, as, as somebody, uh, as a psychologist, I can tell you that's just uh, uh, thoughts and feelings, those are just categories we made up to differentiate among uh, some of our biological states that happen involving the brain, 
and some of them we call feelings, and some of them we call thoughts, but if you're the one person who can tell me you've ever had a thought uh, that didn't have any feelings attached to it, I would like to meet you, and we need to scan your brain. Um, because in fact, thoughts and feelings, reason and emotion are all the time happening at the same time. They're physiological processes that happen together. They're certainly not opposite. Uh, and this idea that uh, reason then is superior to emotion is just as silly as the idea that, that males are superior to females or that whites are superior uh, to people of color or that straights are superior to queers. Um, uh, uh, oh, 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 oh. But it's deeper, it gets even deeper. Because the logic of domination also tells us something about how oppression works. And this is something we need to understand, right? We need to understand the mechanics of something if we're gonna fix it. Same thing, fix a car, you gotta know how a car works, right? Which I do not, but I can fix a bike. Um, so that's good. Um, Okay, so what the logic of domination does is it not only divides the world into these binaries that are seen as opposite one another and differently valued, but it, it links the items on each side of the divide. So males are considered to be more rational while females are considered to be more emotional. Yeah? Uh, uh, whites for a long time said they were the only ones who had civilizations and were always portraying people of color as closer to nature. You want to put somebody down, call them an animal name. Right? And so we start to see how, exactly how it is that these different forms of oppression not only are linked together, but support one another. Because it's this whole set of thoughts linked up together. Make sense? Okay, good. Next important point in intersectionality. We're getting even more practical. But I hope that you in your own minds are, are are, are, are some of you at least, are you starting to like see some implications here? Maybe have some ideas? I'm hoping that you won't rely on me for the ideas. Um, I'll have some good examples, but here's the next important point. Intersectionality says, the theory of intersectionality suggests And I believe it's accurate. And we've seen some evidence that it's accurate. That if you want to make a difference, then where you want to put your energy is at the intersections. <sighs> I wish I had my hands. Um, this is why I didn't want to hold the mic, because I, I, use, I need to gesture. Um, uh, imagine a building that you want to knock down, or even like a chair that you want to demolish. Are you going to hit at, in the middle of the leg, of the chair or just like randomly hit the wall of the house? Or are you gonna go for the joints? You're gonna go for the joints, right? You're gonna go for that, if, if, if the table is propped up on these two uh, intersecting legs, uh, then you could just bang at this part of the table and then bang at that part of the table and then bang at that one leg. And if that one leg, you knock off a little bit of that one leg, but then it just falls down a little, but the other leg keeps it propped up. So you really want to knock that table down, whack at that intersection between those two legs. Knock the legs right out under it. Make sense? Okay. So, 
It also happens to be that if you're working at the intersections, you're going to have more people interested in doing what you're doing, right? Because you're going to have a greater number of people who are affected by this particular uh, 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 focus that you have, yeah? Okay, so the theory of intersectionality then tells us that um, it's not that it's uh, useless to just work on one problem or another, um, but that um, we'll be most effective, we'll get the most bang for our buck if, oh gosh, Euro? Um, you got my joke, okay. Uh, if, if, if we can work at the intersection. So let's talk about some of the implications of this. Wait. Okay, so here are the implications of what I've said so far. First, if we fail to take intersectionality into account, then our understanding of whatever it is we're trying to understand, including speciesism, will be incomplete. All of these forms of oppression exist in a system with one another. And if we're just trying to understand one of them in isolation, no matter how hard we try, if we're not taking the intersections into account, we simply will not have an accurate understanding. And of course, for activism, as with everything, any other kind of problem solving, the first step to effective problem solving is having an accurate conception of what the problem is you're trying to solve, yes? The next implication is that if you don't attend to intersectionality, you may fall into error in various ways. Uh, one way that you might fall into error is uh, what I said before, uh, when you're just sort of whacking away at the one leg and you're not paying attention to the fact that there are these other legs that are propping it up, and so you maybe knock away a little bit of the one leg, but it, it self-corrects, and you haven't actually done what you were intending to do. So that's one form of error you could fall into by not attending to intersectionality. But another form of error that you could uh, uh, fall into would be to take some actions uh, in the service of your goal, which are in fact hurtful to somebody else, so, to some other goal. And, and you might think it doesn't matter but if it's actually all related, then you've hurt yourself as well. And so in the United States, we have, well, I can't tell you how many women uh, who, who, who are quite actively hostile uh, to animal rights because uh, uh, the biggest organization there, PETA, uh, persistently uses sexism um, as part of its campaigns. Uh, and there are women who are offended by this, uh, and it makes it much more difficult for us to talk with them about speciesism, about animal rights, because in their mind, animal rights is part of sexism. Did it make sense? Yeah. Uh, 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 uh. Oh gosh, I guess you, you have had this problem here, too, of... Um, People using xenophobic arguments against population. Yeah. Um, you're getting bored, so I'm moving on. Um, those were the two downsides. The upside is that the theory of intersectionality tells us that if we pay attention to the intersections, we're going to see opportunities. Now, if you remember, uh, 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 those of you who were here yesterday and listening to Steve, and he was talking about overpopulation, and I stepped up from the back and said, well, one thing that we've learned uh, is that if you empower women, they have fewer children. Intersectionality teaches us we don't look at the problem of overpopulation in isolation. Instead, we look at, well, what are the factors that are driving this. Uh, and one of them is women not having control over how many children they have. Uh, women living in poverty uh, and uh, not knowing how many of their children will survive uh, and feeling the need to have more so that at least some will survive. Uh, uh, there are all sorts of factors that come into play and so it turns out that if you both empower women in relation to the men in their lives and economically empower them, they have fewer children. 
The opportunities for us in terms of the animal liberation movement are even bigger. If we attend to intersectionality, if we use this conceptual tool in the way that we could, we will not only gain a more accurate understanding of, what, of, of the problems we're trying to solve, but we will be able to talk about the relationships uh, in ways that will then lead others to see that animal liberation is their project too. Yesterday, Steve was talking a lot about climate change. I personally, uh, 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 in social justice movements, we, we joke about the oppression Olympics. The oppression Olympics is the, you know, my problem's worse than your problem, or we all should work on this because it's the worst problem. And I'm starting to see some oppression Olympics in the animal movement too. Please don't do that. Uh, it, it's, it's really not helpful. Um, but you know what? If there were a winner to the oppression Olympics, if there were one thing that we, we could be said we should drop everything and work on, it would be climate change. Uh, 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 which is affecting uh, far more animals than anything at the moment. Um, and the point is that with climate change, there is this new movement, the environmental justice movement. How many people have heard about environmental justice? Lauren talked about it yesterday some. Okay. At present, the environmental justice movement is probably the quickest growing movement worldwide. Uh, and it is my prediction that as climate change continues apace, this will be uh, the growing social change movement. It's a movement that is intersectional, but not yet fully intersectional. It's intersectional in the sense of that it understands the ways that environment uh, works uh, together around race and around gender and around poverty. Um, but at present, for the most part, not all, but for the most part, the environmental justice movement is a people-based movement uh, that focuses on environmental problems as problems because they hurt people. Um, and has, as a movement has not yet seen that the agenda of the animal liberation movement should be its agenda too. If we can learn to articulate how and why that is, which will also mean, by the way, not just that we get other people to care about animals, uh, but that we uh, care about people. then we start to have bigger numbers than we have. We start to understand that um, this movement, it will succeed or it will fail. We have to hope it will succeed. We have to be part of it anyway. Um, we need animals to have a voice at the table as decisions are being made within that movement about priorities, about tactics, about strategies. So intersectionality gives us uh, some ways of thinking about that. I'm gonna shift gears here, and I'm gonna jump up here and jump around up here to wake you up. Okay, oh, I hate being up here, no. No, I'm coming back down. Um, okay. Watch the steps. Um, have I convinced you that intersectionality is a useful conceptual tool? Okay, so then the question becomes, how do you do it? So our next, the next part of our program will be me telling you uh, some of the things that you can do to build your own capacity for intersectional thinking. Um, uh, sometimes when I'm speaking, I, I, I didn't realize it for a long time until recently a young activist, she was talking to me and she was like, oh, well, Patrice, you know all these things. I'm like, well, 
I don't just magically know them. I wasn't born knowing them. I did things that led me to know them. So I'm going to tell you some of the things that you can do uh, uh, to learn to, 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 to use intersectionality. Now, you're going to have to make an affirmative effort to do this, and I'll tell you why. Uh, 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 if you went to school here in, uh, in Europe, or if you went to school in the United States, then you were schooled within the logic of domination. They may not have taught you that males were superior to females. They probably did imply that culture was superior to nature. They certainly implied that rationality was uh, superior uh, to emotion. And they taught you to think about problems by abstracting them from their context in order to look at them more clearly, yes? You learn, and this works very, very, very well for certain kinds of problem solving. When you are trying to solve an algebraic equation, it is really useful and in fact essential to get x all by itself on one side of the equal sign and everything else on the other side, yes? That's a very useful way to think about a very limited number of problems. But if we think that way about ecological problems, we fall into error or we don't see what we need to see. Imagine there's a pond and in that pond are some fish that a scientist would like to understand. And imagine that in order to understand those fish, the scientist reaches in and he pulls one out and he puts it on the table and the poor fish is gasping for air, or not for air, gasping for water, but finding only air, flops around and dies. And the scientist then says, ha, huh, fish behavior, flopping around and dying. But that's not fish behavior, right? He took the fish out of the context and uh, fell into error. Similarly, let's say that a whole bunch of the fish in that pond start to die. If we only look at the pond, we look and we don't see what could be making them die. Ah, but you know what? It turns out that 30 kilometers away, uh, there's a factory, and that factory isn't releasing anything into the water, but it's got some smokestacks. And out of those smokestacks is coming some pollution, and that pollution has killed some birds, and those birds usually eat some butterflies, and those butterflies, no, oh, let's say dragonflies, and those dragonflies usually eat some other insect, and because they're not eating that other insect, um, uh, this kind of frog uh, doesn't have as much food as it usually has, and so now it's eating the food that the fish usually eat, and the food, fish are dying. That's the, the answer, right? And, and you can't see that answer unless you're actually looking for connections rather than abstractions. Does that make sense? So intersectionality is actually a form of what we would call ecological thinking um, or systems thinking. And in the sciences since the 1970s, we have come to understand, and, and I say we as one kind of scientist, a psychologist, um, uh, but there are in numerous other sciences, uh, uh, in the biological sciences, in physics, uh, again and again and again and again and again, we have come to this understanding that we have to look at systems and, and, and the relationships among elements of the system rather than looking at variables in isolation. Make sense? So we cannot look at foie gras consumption all by itself. Hmm? We have to look at the material and social systems in which the production and consumption of foie gras occurs. 
if we really want to end foie gras. To just take one example. So, you need to think systems-wise, but you've been trained otherwise. And so this means you will have to make, if you haven't already, and I'm, I, I, I do not mean to be disrespectful to anybody who's already been thinking ecologically, um, but for many of us, we have to make an affirmative effort to learn to think relationally rather than abstractly, to learn to think contextually rather than abstractly, to learn to think about systems and the relationships within systems, and then the relationships of systems to one another. And this is hard work. Um, uh, oh, I'm gonna get to the happy part at the end. Um, this is hard work, it's satisfying work though, right? I mean, isn't it great when you like, understand something that you didn't used to understand? You get that little burst of brain chemicals that makes you feel really happy for a second. So, you know, it's hard work, but it's, 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 it's rewarding work and it's essential work. So what do you need to do? One, just be aware that you're going to need to start thinking uh, systematically, intersectionally. If you haven't learned much about ecology in the past, um, it might be time. If you haven't heard of systems thinking before, you might wanna look it up on Wikipedia. But you also may want to set yourself some very specific tasks. Um, and now I am going to go up because I'm going to have to read while I talk about it. Um, here's what I did. Oh, I didn't even tell you who I am. I, it was just this vague reference, right, of the sanctuary and social justice work, right? Okay, I started doing social justice work in the 1970s as part of the gay and lesbian movement, uh, 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 which was actually the same year I quit eating meat. I didn't know at the time they were linked. Um, and then there did come a time where I worked for several years at the Ella Baker Nelson Mandela Center for Anti-Racist Education, uh, which uh, is in, uh, was in uh, Michigan in the United States and which worked from an uh, intersectional perspective. And I'm telling you that little piece of my history because what I did for a number of years while I was working at the Baker Mandela Center and while I was teaching a course on the theory and practice of social change activism was, was to go on a multi-year uh, process of teaching myself to think intersectionally and uh, to see connections. So um, this advice I'm giving you is, is advice based on this is what I did and it helped me a lot, okay? So the first thing that you need to do when you want to see intersections is to have some knowledge of the things that you're trying to see intersections among. I know that might sound really basic, but it's really important. You can't expect yourself to see the intersections between speciesism and racism if you don't know anything at all about racism, how could you possibly see the intersections? If you've not educated yourself about whatever it is that you're trying to understand and, and, and you would like very much to talk to people about how animal liberation relates to this thing that they care about, well, how are you gonna do that if you don't know anything at all about this thing that they care about? So you have to educate yourself. And I know you can do that. Uh, ha -ha. <laughs> I know you can do that because I know that none of you learned about foie gras in school, and yet most of you can probably tell me in the most horrific detail exactly how foie gras is produced, right? Uh, those of you who work on vivisection issues can tell me the most horrifying things. Um, and the most detailed things about research protocols because you took the time to learn them. Same thing with animal agriculture, any other uh, issue. Uh, and so what I'm here to tell you is you may need to learn, in fact, you will need to learn about things that seem to be not about animals, but are in fact part of this system of domination that works together 
to create the circumstances under which animals are exploited and their habitats destroyed. So you may need to learn things about race. You may need to learn the mechanics of capitalism if you don't know it already. So educate yourself. Next, this is the fun part. Set yourself some tap. This is what I used to do. I would just sit down and I would say, okay, today, I'm going to think about the intersection between sexism and prejudice against people with disabilities. And I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna figure out everything I can about that intersection. I would set myself these little tasks. So here are the little tasks you can set yourself. First, you can pick a problem, like um, hunger or zoos. And then think as hard as you can about where there might be not just speciesism, but other forms of oppression, huh? If you're thinking about hunger, oh my gosh, you'll find out things about gender. If you're thinking about zoos, then maybe you'll learn the history and learn that they were imperial products. You'll learn that people of color were held in zoos. You'll, you'll, you'll learn the political purposes of zoos. You'll learn the ideological purposes of zoos. You'll, you'll figure out that zoos are all about that logic of domination, all about saying, we're so powerful as people, we can create a savanna in Sweden. We can create an Arctic climate in the Mediterranean. That's how powerful people are. And suddenly you'll be able to talk about zoos so much more richly with so many more people in ways that will captivate and interest them. And you might find yourself starting to care um, uh, 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 about uh, uh, other pieces of this. So picking a problem and just saying, what are all the different intersections I can see? Another thing is to pick a particular practice, like the practice of locking people up in prisons or abstracting calves and milk from dairy cows and figure out how, what are all the different intersections you can see in that one thing? Does that make, do you hear what I'm saying? Okay. Another thing is you could pick a particular intersection. You could say, okay, well, I want to think about how speciesism and sexism relate, and then really sit down and think it through. And if it turns out you don't know enough about sexism to think it through, uh-oh, time to go read a book. You can think about an aspect of, 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 of one form of, 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 uh, of oppression and then see if it turns up in other places. Like reprocentrism. Reprocentrism. Everything depends in animal exploitation on the controlled reproduction. Yes? Controlled reproduction, forced reproduction making female animals have more uh, and different child, uh, more children than they would want to have from partners that they did not choose. Hmm, do we see that anywhere else? Oh gosh, yes, it turns out that reprocentrism is uh, central to capitalism, central to patriarchy, central to homophobia. So you can pick an aspect. You can look at an impact of one form of oppression and see whether that impact will reverberate and affect other forms of oppression or help to create other forms of oppression. Hmm? Mm, we're in a former slaughterhouse here. What do you have to do to work at a slaughterhouse? You gotta cut your feelings off, yeah? 
you develop what, what psychologists call callousness. Yeah? And not caring. It's the same thing you've got to do if you're going to pull a, uh, somebody like my poncho away from his mother and tie him to a tractor. What do you have to do to be able to do something like that? You have to develop calluses on your heart. Yeah? And then you're walking around as a person with calluses on your heart. Huh. Do calluses on your heart make it more or less likely that you're going to care about child slavery? Do calluses on your heart make it more or less likely you're going to uh, abuse your kids? Do calluses on your heart mean that you're going to be able to sleep soundly even though that you know your whole life depends on the subordination of other beings. That your whole economic way of life is built not just on the backs of non-human animals but on the backs of workers. I think the answers to those questions are obvious. So you can think about one impact of the form of, of, of oppression you're thinking about and, and whether or not it reverberates to create other problems, what seem to be other problems but are part of one big system of oppression. Next, um, you can think about a particular feature, one feature uh, that's very um, common, uh, let's say in both racism and speciesism, is the invisibility of privilege. Uh, for the most part, White people in the United States, but elsewhere as well, walk around without any conception whatsoever of the very real and material benefits that they get by virtue of their skin. And I would argue that most people, other than animal liberationists, walk around without any conscious awareness of uh, the, they haven't thought through the privileges that they have over other animals, huh? They're just assumed. They're not even visible to them. They're not even thinking about it. You're like, oh my God, this is so illogical. How can you be acting this way? How can you be thinking this way? Well, I'll tell you why, because they're not thinking about it. It's invisible to them. So the invisibility of privilege. Oh, and not thinking about things. That's another good one, right? I don't know how many times our sanctuary used to be located in a poultry producing region for the first nine years. We were actually on a little, we had like two acres and there were little early factory farms all around us. I couldn't bike 10 minutes in any direction without seeing factory farms. And now we're in an area of uh, dairy uh, production. Um, I don't know how many times people involved in the poultry industry said to me, and I quote to you, I couldn't do it if I thought about it. Not thinking about it. Well, gosh, there's all sorts of things we're not thinking about, huh? Climate change? So not thinking about it turns out to be not a particularly helpful habit of mind. And so that's another intersection. And one that environmentalists might be very interested in talking about. All right. I'm going to run through. Where, where are we time-wise? Somebody tell me time-wise. I've got 20 minutes? OK. Very quickly, um, I'm going to tell you, I already started. This actually leads right into what the next thing was. I, I, I've done, obviously, a good bit of thinking about the intersections between speciesism and other forms of, 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 of oppression. And I'm going to tell you some of the things that I have come up with. I've already started to do that in these, in these examples. But I do not want you to think, by any means, that this exhausts what could be said about it, um, or that, um, that you shouldn't be thinking too. Uh, 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 because we've just begun to think about this. I said we've been thinking about intersectionality since the 70s, but this, this thinking about intersectionality and how we think about speciesism, thinking about how speciesism relates to other things, this is very new. 
um, uh, uh, and, and we need everybody to be thinking uh, creatively about it. So here are some things that I've thought about. First of all, that the same three excuses are used uh, to justify animal exploitation and uh, human uh, uh, the subordination of one, the subordination or, or exploitation of one group of people by another group of people. And the, the three excuses are, um, might makes right. Don't even bother to, to come up with an excuse. Just do it. Uh, we've got, we're in separate categories and our category has these special abilities that your category doesn't have. And that makes us superior, and so we're able to exploit you. And then, of course, um, God told us we could. Um, and I don't think you need me to explain to you uh, how uh, 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 these inform not just um, animal exploitation, but the exploitation of uh, people by a people. Next, reprocentrism. I already talked about. Oh, this habit of wrenching ourselves up and out of the ecosystem and then turning around and chopping it into little bits and pieces to be bought and sold for profit kind of uh, underlies the whole thing. Mm. Invisibility proof, not thinking about callousness. Ah, okay, so I said most of them in telling you the examples of how to think about things. One other one I just want to talk, two other ones I want to talk about is one is contempt for the helpless, contempt for the weak, um, and instrumentalism, the using of other beings as instruments for your purposes. Y'all are doing so well at like dealing with a really long lecture. I just want to say thank you very much. Uh, if, 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 if you were my students, we would have broken this up into several half hour classes and had lots of naps and coffee in between. Um, all right, so here are some of the tenets, the tenets, the basic principles of ecofeminist activism, uh, uh, including intersectionality. The first is be mindful of intersections. The second is to strategize with systems in mind. Uh, and what that means is no telling people just go vegan without thinking very carefully, as Lauren Annalis talked about uh, last week, uh, last week, yesterday, um, about uh, who has access to food where the food comes from. Uh, no imagining that if we just tell all these people to go vegan, the uh, animal agriculture system will collapse all by itself. That's not how capitalism works. Capitalism is a really important system that we have to pay attention to here. And how capitalism works is that if you convince some consumers to quit consuming something, they just use advertisers to get other consumers to consume more of that thing. And so for every person that we've convinced not to drink cow's milk anymore, there's a person over here who is now buying Greek yogurt, which takes twice as much milk as other kinds of yogurt. Did you think it was an accident that the Greek, do you have the Greek yogurt fad here? Or is it just in the United States? In the United States, there's this huge fad for what they call Greek yogurt. It happens to take twice as much milk to make. Um, they also load cheese into all sorts of things. So that's how capitalism works. Um, when possible, work at the intersections. And I'm gonna give you some examples in a minute. Uh, always take local conditions into account while being mindful of global systems. And if you're working on global systems, you're still gonna be doing it in a particular place and you have to take those local conditions into account. It is not true that things that some United States psychologists learned by studying US college students will be applicable to how you talk about veganism to people in other places. It is not true. Might seem nice, 
but there's just this little recipe that we all can follow. It doesn't work that way. Next, be grounded. That's why I started with Pancho in the sanctuary. What we do has always got to be grounded in the real lives of actual animals, human and non-human. Okay, some examples that you've already heard, and then one you haven't heard, and then we'll be done. Uh, yesterday, uh, some of you were lucky enough to hear Lauren Ornelas from the Food Empowerment Project talk about their work. Uh, the Food Empowerment Project, uh, well, I, I wish I had time to just uh, reproduce the talk for people who weren't there. Uh, 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 but the Food Empowerment Project has done um, some extraordinary work, on the one hand, thinking about barriers uh, to healthy eating, including veganism, in uh, low-income communities of color. Uh, they, uh, they didn't just come in uh, with some ideas that they had up in their heads. They said, let's do some research. They went to actual grocery stores in the actual neighborhoods they were interested in. They talked to people from the actual communities in their own language to find out uh, what their concerns were. Make sense? Um, uh, at the same time, they've been pushing on us vegans to not think that if we're eating chocolate that was picked by child slaves, that's cruelty free. Oh, and palm oil too, by the way. All right, so that's one example. Then those of you who are lucky enough to hear Dobruja uh, uh, from Poland talk about their remarkable, um, uh, I would consider eco-feminist uh, uh, project of, of organizing uh, in Polish villages against fur farms. Here they went in respectfully, although they became even more respectful as the project went on, as she tells us. Here they went in, uh, well, first of all, here they recognized an opportunity. Poland is, Dobruja, where are you? How many, what's, is, are you like the top fur producer in the? Yeah, we are the third. Okay, so, so, so this is local conditions into account. It would be not really smart for me living in Vermont in the United States to decide that fur should be a focus of my activism. Um, I'm in a, uh, there's no fur farms in my area, and uh, I live in a low-income rural region, so there aren't any people wearing fur either. Um, uh, that would not be smart, but they are in an area where not only uh, is there already existing fur production, but because of the economic circumstances in Eastern Europe, um, uh, the rural areas are really vulnerable to having factory farms moved in. Um, uh, as Lauren was pointing out uh, uh, yesterday, uh, 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 economic, uh, environmental injustice means that factory farms and other polluting industries are much more likely to be located in low-income communities. Uh, in the U.S., that's communities of color particularly. Uh, uh, I'm guessing here in Europe we're looking at Eastern Europe uh, as where we're going to really see a push to, to, to put in new factory farms. Uh, so, so, so so they knew that they had an opportunity to work. They went and, um, and, 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 and I'm sorry, because I'm trying to say in a sentence what you did a whole presentation on, but essentially what they did was empower the villagers. And those of you who are from rural areas know uh, there's prejudice against rural people, yeah? Uh, from city people. And in, in, in capitalism, most decisions are made in the cities. Uh, and a lot of times, uh, rural people, particularly poor and working class rural people, don't have a lot of political power. And so what they did was give political, give skills and tools, share, not give, share, skills and tools with villagers, while at the same time educating them um, about the fur farms. And the folks decided, hey, we don't want this. And so it wasn't animal rights activists blocking the fur farms, it was the villagers themselves blocking blockading the roads, elderly women manning, uh, staffing the blockades to keep the fur farms out. 
That's what happens when you look at, when you can work at the intersections where you can see, well, look, here are some folks, uh, and yeah, they should be concerned about the fur farms for environmental reasons, and we're concerned about them for ethical reasons, but these folks are also disempowered because of their um, uh, economic class. And so we can work at that intersection where they're vulnerable. Why is the fur farm going to be located there? Because of the intersection. It's not just, it's, it's this particular place. You already got my point. I'm not going to keep saying it again. So, so next, Georgie. If you were here, if you, if you listened to Georgie's talk um, about uh, Brazil, uh, then uh, you heard how uh, uh, his organization is working in genuine and sincere alliance with indigenous people in opposition to a dam that is likely to flood, that if it is built, will flood an area as large as this whole country in the Amazon. Uh, and, 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 and if that dam is built, then uh, 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 so many animals will suffer, yes? And so many people will suffer. And so this is an intersection, and they're working at that intersection, and they've, if, if you were there, you saw crowds that those of us who are animal advocates in other places could only hope to ever uh, summon up for a protest. Uh, these are just a few examples. Um, I, I have to, I'm, I'm always getting in trouble for not um, promoting my own organization enough. Um, because I'm so busy talking about the ideas that are interesting to me. So I just want to tell you that our organization, Vine Sanctuary, originally Eastern Shore Sanctuary, was the first to figure out how to rehabilitate roosters uh, used in cockfighting. Um, which, of course, we wouldn't do if we were just going by numbers of animals oppressed, because it's not a really large number of animals uh, that this happens to, but I still think it's worth doing. Um, uh, so uh, basically what happened, how much time do I have? Seven minutes. Seven minutes. Without questions, oh my gosh. <laughs> All right, so you can go and read about it. I, too bad, because I was going to act out roosters. Um, Uh, uh, basically, what we figured out, we, 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 the very first bird that we rescued we thought was a hen, and then turned out to be a rooster. Um, and this then led us uh, to start thinking about the stereotypes that people have about hens and roosters. And this then led us to understand uh, something very important about the intersection between speciesism and sexism, which is that people use animals as part of the process of socially constructing gender roles. People in storybooks and cartoons and movies and in activities like cockfighting uh, map their gender roles, their ideas like males are aggressive onto animals and then either trick or force the animals into acting out those stereotypes and then they point to the animal and say, well, animals do it, so it's natural. And this helps to make very injurious ideas about gender, such as the idea that males are inherently aggressive. Now, I know that we feminists are always uh, charged with being um, anti-male, so I'm always amused to be the person who figured out how to help these roosters. Um, and, and it was because I do not believe the stereotypes about males. Um, and so we figured out that these birds are fighting because they were traumatized. These birds were not fighting because they were aggressive, they were fighting because they were terrified. And they were terrified because of the things that people had done to them. Cutting off their combs, raising them in isolation, injecting them with testosterone and methamphetamine, attaching knives to their spurs. And then when they try to run away, throwing them back into the fight again. So we figured out, and when those animals did come to us, yes, they did try to fight. Not just other roosters, anybody they saw. Songbirds flying by. And we put into place um, a program which you can read about online if you visit our website. Uh, we were the first and now other people do it as well. 
Um, but along the way, we thought and we talked about gender. And talking about these issues, I can tell you, I don't know how many times I've been invited to talk to feminist audiences about animals, about the roosters, and guess what? While I'm talking to them about that, I also mention, um, oh, I don't know, what happens to cows? And the next thing you know, all the women in the audience are like holding their breasts um, because I'm asking them to imagine what would happen to them. And the next thing you know, they're telling me they're gonna quit milk. So that's the power of intersectionality. Um, and I have to end on a happy note. So, because I really am hopeful, because I choose to be. So here we are, we're in a former slaughterhouse, yes? Former. And, and I'm not gonna pretend that it was animal liberation activism that made this be a former slaughterhouse. I understand that um, this is not the first time I've been in a meeting in a former slaughterhouse, and I understand that slaughterhouses used to be located in cities, and then people became uncomfortable with that, and they got relocated out to rural areas, and that's why this is a former slaughterhouse. But nonetheless, the fact that this is a space in which animals used to be killed, and now it's a space where we're talking about how to liberate animals, this needs to remind you not just that change is possible, but that the absence of change is impossible. Change is the only biological constant. Everything is changing. You're different than you were when you walked in here. Like while you were here, your breakfast became part of your body and, and, and you shedded some skin cells, and plus now you maybe know some things you didn't know, and, and, and the things you've heard me say are actually now your neurons in your brain is different than it was before. Change happens constantly. The only question is, what direction is the change gonna go in? And we get to help say how that will happen happen, and we will be much more effective in doing so if we pay attention to these things that I've been talking about. The other thing that I notice in this place, have you noticed there's these vines that are growing up all around the buildings? Yes? Yeah? All right, so this reminds me that There are forces, you can call it, you want to call it nature, call it nature. Way more powerful than any guns or government ever could be. Tree roots can break up concrete. Vines can pull down fences. The sun shines down far more energy than we need every day, and plants and animals and people are making exuberant use of that energy, but not exuberant enough, right? Because we're all constrained by this same logic of domination that oppresses animals. We're animals too, yeah? We're subjugated by it. We're cut off from our own desires. We're cut off from each other. Do you know there's some countries uh, where uh, homosexuality is illegal? You know that, right? You know there's some countries where you go to jail for it? You know, it used to be like even here maybe, I know in the United States you used to be able to go to jail for it, right? Also, uh, relation, sexual relations between people of so-called different races, do you know that there's many, many times that those have been illegal? Yeah? People go to jail for it? You could, you could be killed for it. Did people do it anyway? Yes. Yes. A lot. You know why? 
because that, I don't know whether you want to call it love, I don't know whether you want to call it eros, I don't know whether you want to call it reaching for a connection, that impulse in you is there, you were born with it, it's your strongest natural resource, and I'm here to tell you it's a renewable source of energy. Um, and it's way more powerful than guns and governments. And what it reaches, what it tells you to do is make connections to other people. And I'm not just talking about like getting lucky. I'm talking about, I'm talking about real meaningful connections with other beings. Other people, yes, but other animals, yes. Ecosystems, yes. You have that impulse, it is there, and you wanna make connections. You might have been thinking when you were listening to Steve talk, or anytime here, you think, oh my God, this is so big. How can I, how can I, how can I solve this problem? You can't. We can. And so that impulse that leads you, uh, notice I'm still talking about connections, intersections. That's the whole theme of this, this talk, yeah? So the more that you understand these intersections, then the more able you're going to be not just to see connections between different problems, but to make real and meaningful connections with other people who will work with you, and together there will be enough of us to do what we need to do. And I think I am out of time now, and I know you're gonna want lunch. So thank you for listening to me.